So if you're like me, the summertime means you can get outdoors. And perhaps you like to go ride on your bike or do something uh, fun like that. Well, after the bike's been sitting in the storage uh, in the garage for all winter, usually the tires are a little bit flat. Well, one way to fix that is to pull out your air compressor, AKA your pressure vessel. So go ahead and take a look at this example. We're gonna actually analyze a air compressor tank uh, as a pressure vessel and measure the stresses in that particular piece of equipment at a certain pressure. So in this example problem, we are going to compress the air in the tank up to a pressure of 100 PSI. Uh, we measured the internal diameter of the tank to be about 14 inches and the wall thickness to be 3 sixteenths of an inch. We want to go ahead and draw the stress components acting at point A along with their magnitude. And then we want to answer the question, if the yield stress of the steel is 50 KSI, will this pressure vessel fail using Tresca's criterion? So the first thing we should do when we deal with pressure vessels is see if we can use the thin-walled analysis. So the thin-walled analysis considers the inner radius over the thickness. For this particular problem, the inner radius is going to be the diameter divided by 2, so 14 inches divided by 2, and the thickness of the wall is given to us as 3 sixteenths of an inch. So going ahead and doing that calculation, we see the inner radius is 7 inches, and then the thickness is 0 0.1875 inches, and I can do a little bit of math and I get the value 37.33. I compare this to my cutoff limit of 10. I want to make sure I'm greater than or equal to 10 so I can use thin-walled analysis. So as you can see, we're much greater than 10, so the thin-walled analysis will apply. Since we can use a thin-walled analysis in this particular case, we can use the formulas that we developed during this lesson to calculate the hoop and the longitudinal stresses. So I'll start with the hoop stress. The hoop stress was a value that we said was sigma 1 when we defined it in our formula. And sigma 1 was equal to PR over T, the pressure times the radius over the thickness. So substituting the known values from this problem, the pressure inside this cylinder is 100 PSI. The radius is 7 inches. And our thickness is 3 sixteenths of an inch. So I go through and I calculate sigma 1. Sigma 1 is going to be 3733 PSI or 3.733 KSI. I'll repeat my calculations for the longitudinal stress. The longitudinal stress, we gave the variable sigma 2, and this was equal to a value of PR over 2T, the pressure times the radius over 2 times the thickness. I can go ahead and plug in my values again. I can also realize that uh, sigma 2 is half of sigma 1, so if I just want to take the value that I already calculated, uh, calculated and divide by 2, I can. And so doing the math, I get that si sigma 2 is 1867 PSI, or 1.867 KSI. The next step in the problem is to sketch these stresses on an element acting at point A. So remember, one of our big goals in mechanics and materials is to be able to sketch the stress components at any point in our assembly. So whether it be a structure, whether it be an object that we're looking to analyze uh, from a mechanical engineering standpoint, no matter where we're looking, we're looking to find the stresses acting at that point in a solid mass. So I go ahead and I draw my little sketch I'm going to put in the hoop stress, of course, in the circumferential direction. Sigma 1 equals to 3.733 KSI, and then sigma 2 is 1.867 KSI. We should also consider sigma 3, and this would be the pressure on the inside of the cylinder. So the pressure sigma 3 would be equal to a negative 100 PSI, because it's pressing against the surface at A. This would correspond to negative 0.1 KSI. 
When we look at that negative 0.1 KSI of sigma 3 compared to sigma 1 and 2, we see that it's relatively small. And again, because we're using a thin-walled analysis, we're going to assume sigma 3 is equal to 0. I also want to note that I have no shear stresses on this element. So we've been calling these sigma 1 and sigma 2, and that is because sigma 1 and sigma 2 are principal stresses. And so I have no shear through the thickness of the element, and I have no shear in the other directions. And so therefore, the state of stress that's shown is the principal state of stress for this element. So that'll make my calculation for more circle even easier than I usually uh, encounter. So sketching more circle in here, I'll label my axes, sigma and tau. And I'm going to label uh, the point sigma 1 at 3.733 KSI. Then we have sigma 2 at 1.867 KSI. And then we have sigma 3 at 0. Now I'm drawing my Mohr circle because I want to check Tresca's criterion. And we always uh, tied back our failure criterion to the Mohr circle sketch on this element. We see that that element is in plane stress. So we're able to use the Mohr circle uh, approximation to quickly get the maximum and minimum principal stresses on this object, as well as obtain the absolute maximum shear stress acting on this element. So I'll go ahead and sketch my circles in place. You can do this as neatly as you can. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of my uh, electronic program to make some nice circles here. Uh, but we need to connect a circle from sigma 1 and sigma 2. We need to draw in a circle between sigma 2 and sigma 3. And then we also need to draw in a more circle that connects sigma 1 and sigma 3. And so I have that here drawn in red. Now we know that Tresca's criterion looks at the absolute maximum shear stress in the element. So we know that that absolute max shear stress will occur on the red circle, and it'll be located down here at the bottom of the circle. Uh, again, because our, I draw my positive tau downwards uh, to facilitate my rotations on my Mohr circle. All right, I need to calculate tau max absolute. Tau max absolute will be equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 over 2, and then take the absolute value. If you're paying attention, you would see that the radius of that red circle is actually equal to sigma 2 in this instance, uh, because sigma 2 is halfway between sigma 1 and sigma 3. So tau max absolute is 1.867 KSI. So now I can go ahead and check my Tresca's criterion for failure. So Tresca hypothesized that failure occurs when the absolute max shear stress reaches a critical value. So when tau max absolute, which is equal to the absolute value of sigma 1 minus sigma 3 over 2, when that exceeds the yield stress divided by 2, where we obtain the yield stress from a uniaxial tension test, that's when we have failure. So now I need to compare this 1.867 KSI value to the yield stress divided by 2. I go back up to my problem statement. I see my yield stress was given as 50 KSI. Divide that by 2. So I ask the question, is 1.867 KSI, is that greater than... 25 KSI, and hopefully you see that the answer is no. So since the answer is no, then we do not predict failure to occur. And that is our final answer for this particular pressure vessel. So I hope you found this interesting. This is a very uh, standard setup for a pressure vessel problem. We know the pressure inside the cylinder. We know the dimensions of the cylinder. And we want to determine if failure is likely to occur. 
Now we usually have huge safety factors when it comes to pressure vessels. So you can see our stress was much lower than what was needed from Tresca's criterion. And that's because when pressure vessels fail, they're pretty spectacular. So imagine a compressed air container blowing up. You know that failure is spectacular and you don't want it to happen in uh, the regular engineering life.